If you want news and rumors that appeal, welcome to the dust. If you want news and rumors that appeal, welcome to the dust. Hey, welcome back to the Dusty Wheel. I'm your host, The Innkeeper, and this is our live call and talk show all about the Wheel of Time, except for today. I mean, it's going to be about the Wheel of Time. It just won't be a live call and talk show. It's live, though. It's just not a call and talk show. It's a talk show, though. I guess I should have uh, realized which part of that wasn't exactly the right. <laughs> so uh, we're here. We're back on a Sunday, which is maybe not as normal around here. And yes, for those of you in chat, we started on time. I mean, like on the hour. I guess for us, on time is still... You know, we're before time. I don't know how to explain that, but uh, I have two wonderful guests with me, and I will introduce them here shortly. But I want to remind you of something important, and actually very important to my two guests. So, just as a reminder, everyone, yes, uh, WatCon. That's right, WatCon is coming up, and if you want to join us there, if you want to join my guests there tomorrow, June nineteenth at eleven p.m. That's right, Central Time is the last time you'll be able to register. So please uh, consider it if you haven't and go over there, uh, find, you can find WatCon. I think it's just WatCon.com. Uh, you can also find the link in the description after this video. I'll make sure that's there. And I'm sure the people we have are wonderful mods in chat will drop the link there. So um, <laughs> I just saw Bain and she had say, and uh, Innkeeper Morning Voice, it's been a while. Yes, this is my, uh, <laughs> this is my Innkeeper's Morning Voice. <laughs> Uh, and it has been a while since we've done a Sunday show, and that's why I do appreciate uh, my guests joining me here today. So let me welcome to the show Dr. Michael Livingston and the head of the unofficial fan club, Brian, my good friend, the Gleeman. Cheers to hey. both of you. Cheers. Cheers. Hey. Cheers. How's everybody? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Brian, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm, uh, I'm here with uh, the, the subject of my fan club, Michael Livingston, uh, <laughs> and, and my good friend, Matt. Um, and uh, we get to talk about history and the Wheel of Time and talk, crack jokes. And uh, yeah, this is awesome. This is a great Sunday for me. 
Right on. And we, and we have a we have a we have some maybe a little surprises coming to WatCon. I mean, I don't, that's all I'm gonna say. But yeah, there's yeah. some there's some good surprises. We got yeah. we got them. Yeah, we got some good stuff coming. <laughs> 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 uh, Michael, why Michael gave us that look? That's right. I think you should you should you should keep that in mind. Anyways, uh, what, how are suspicious. you doing? I'm suspicious. Uh, <laughs> what I, I don't know. I have no idea why you'd be suspicious. That's crazy. Uh, how are, how are you doing, Michael? Uh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, hopefully, coming through okay. Uh, I'm in Thessaloniki, Greece, right now. So, um, yeah, life's good. Life, yeah. We've been for those of you that are not following. Um, uh, Michael on social media should be because you can see some amazing photos he's taking during his travels. So uh, beyond that, I, I think the last time we were all together here, all three of us talking about this book that you now can't see because Brian's in the way. That's Brian. right. Ooh, Origins of the Wheel of Time. There it is. I love the uh, the cover kind of giving us like a, some blue effect there. Um, and uh, I think one of the things I said when I introduced you uh, uh, Mike, to this show was you have now become the person, he who gets to answer all of our Wheel of Time questions. Now, I think that's how. I think that's you didn't how know what I you were it. signing up for. <laughs> and every time you say it, I think, "Oh my God, pressure." Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, good times, good times. Was that was I in France last time we or have no? We talked since then. Yeah, no, yeah, because we talked right after the book. It was like right after the book came out. Right that's after the right. book came out. Yeah, so that's right. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's how, how has the weight of that, has that kind of settled? Is it like normal? You just walk around with it or is it literally each time I bring it up, people bring it up, it, you, you recognize it again. Uh, you know, I walk around feeling, uh, pretty badass. Um, you know, most days as a result, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it honestly, uh, yeah. Every time you say it, Oh God, please don't say it. And then you do. Which is, I think, why you say it. Um, yeah, it, it, it's um, it, it's it's pressure, right? But it's also, I mean, it's a privilege. I, I got to 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 be on the inside in a way that you know, if you have been or whatever, um, yep. and that's and that's really amazing, right? As a fan, um, it's uh, you know, it's it's something I can't I can't set aside, and it's. Uh, you know, it's just a real privilege. So, so yeah, I guess I'm, I'm accustomed to it as much as yeah. one can be. Um, I just don't want to screw it up. Sure. Um, and, uh, this is now 90 minutes of an opportunity to screw it up. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, no, so no, we appreciate it. We, we honestly place, do. I hope place that... your bets in chat, place your bets. <laughs> and, I, and I should say this before it goes too far, too much further. Yes. Everyone you've shown up on uh, a wonderful Sunday. Yes. Happy father's day to all. I agree with that uh, statement. And, uh, so for those of you that have yet to celebrate already celebrated or plan to celebrate afterwards, yes. Happy father's day to you all. Uh, this is a conversation that I've threatened to have many times, uh, which is to say, after reading, you know, knowing a little bit about what you do, uh, uh, what you've studied, what your background is, and uh, once you've done Origins of the Wheel of Time and reading that book, I always wanted to come back and really focus on this topic of war and Robert Jordan and the books uh, because of maybe my own lack of knowledge, uh, lack of kind of like personal knowledge. Uh, I think the most I really recognize for war is probably across the television set um, from my just, uh, when it comes to my family, and I, I don't have like, uh, I have connections, obviously, to grandparents in that way. But uh, when it comes to war, it's like in books, in movies, yeah. and, and across the TV. So uh, really, uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So maybe jump us in, like, why medieval military history? Why do I do what I do? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, because they're they're dumb enough to pay me, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> and if any of them are listening, please keep doing so. Um, yeah, I I got fascinated with uh, what's the short end of this story? The short end of this story is that um, I knew I wanted to be a history teacher, uh, yeah. and and pretty quickly figured out that I could only do that at the college level. Um, I, I couldn't handle the maturity of kids in high school or, or below. I couldn't do it. So I knew I needed to be in college level. 
And uh, during the course of my undergraduate, I spent a semester abroad in Europe, fell in love with Europe, um, but I was sort of caught in between, I was double majoring history and religion and doing my honors coursework on the development of first century Christianity. Um, so in fact, my first publication is in first century Christianity. Um, but then I was also captivated with like the world wars and stuff like that. Uh, I figured, you know what? The middle ages is smack dab in the middle. So let me just, let me just do that. Like Venn diagram this thing. And, uh, and yeah, in the course of graduate work, um, just fell deeper and deeper in love with it. And, um, and, and, and through the, the vagaries of my career became a, an expert on conflict analysis. Uh, but essentially the locating and reconstructing of uh, medieval conflict, uh, medieval and ancient conflict. So can, yeah, can you it's, it's cool can stuff. You, can you describe that? Like when you say conflict, is it from the strategies, from the, who was there? It's, is it every single piece of that conflict that you're analyzing? Just the equipment they had, the battlefield they were on, the, the minds behind what was happening, the, the context of the culture at the time. Yeah, I mean, in fact, all of that, man. Um, I mean, you know, t typically what happens is I get, I get asked to come look at something, um, you know, like a, like a battle. Um, you know, this the, the battle site is supposedly here. Here's supposedly the battle that happened there. Is that correct, right? And and you know, I'm doing the work of trying to figure out does this location make sense? What do our sources say happened there? Um, do those sources make sense, right? Trying to sort of analyze from the biggest picture of who, what, where, when, you know, down to, um, you know, did that, did that ditch in the field cause this battle to happen one way rather than another, right? Yeah. Um, we, it's actually today is the, the anniversary of Waterloo. And Waterloo is kind of a, somewhat a famous case in point for that, right? The Battle of Waterloo there is a a, a, a a sunken road that Napoleon isn't aware of. And that road makes a huge difference in the outcome of the Battle of Waterloo. Battle of Waterloo huh. is so massive that lots of things are happening. But in, in one particular uh, pivotal moment, that sunken road is incredibly important. Um, you would only know that by going back to the sources and going back to the maps and reconstructing it because you can't do it on the field today. That sunken road is no longer there. It's been covered over by a uh, gaudy, horrible, disgusting mound of earth with a stupid monument on it to a stupid man. Uh, so screw up the battlefield. I feel like but this is a very specific description here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's there. Uh, it's there. It's the most the most visible thing on that battlefield. It's this big mound of earth with a statue on it. Um, and uh, and yeah, they when they put that up, they eff effectively ruined the battlefield. So uh, awesome, good times. But but yeah, that that's kind of what I do. Um, and and you know, and to be honest, that is a um, something I just love doing. I mean, I just. I just truly love it. Like, um, I've looked at on this trip between France and Scotland and now Greece. Um, God, I've done like six battle sites so far in the past uh, two and a half weeks or three weeks, however long I've been here. Um, and I got more to come. So, yeah, I love it. You mentioned um, that Napoleon, there was a second road. Napoleon didn't know about it, it changed the course of the battle. Uh, in so important way. What's the dumbest way that you know of that a battle has been changed in its direction? Like a, a soldier lost a boot and hit knocked into another soldier and there's a domino effect and the whole line fell over and then they lost. Is, is there anything, uh, like, anything like that? The, the Battle of Pydna, which is the, the battle that ends Macedon. So uh, Alexander the Great, Macedonia, that, uh, that, that kingdom ends uh, Rome defeats the Macedonians uh, at the Battle of Pydna, and that fight happens because two um, groups of, of, of guys from both sides 
go to the same watering hole between the armies uh, to try and get water. And um, one one of the stories has something to do with the, the donkey. And I can't remember what the donkey does. Donkey freaks out and scares some guys. Then they think that's a fight. And then pretty soon it becomes an envelopment and everybody comes in. Uh, and that's the end of Macedon because um, they went for water. So yeah, that's history is full of stupid things like that you know <laughs> i mean just really stupid things not you know not to mention stupid um behaviors at times or at least what look like stupid behaviors and i should i should say that because one of my one of my mantras when i'm looking at fields is no man is a fool Perfect. um you know that that no no general is an idiot what what they do might seem idiotic given the outcome but in the moment they thought this was the best thing right. and and it behooves us to sort of figure out why they thought it was a good thing uh some of those are more difficult to do than others um i was just doing uh, uh the battle of castillon which is supposedly the last battle of the hundred years war um i say supposedly because of the book i'm working on right now but anyway um uh, the battle disrupting of history again Nice. <laughs> Whoops. Um, the Battle <laughs> of Castillon, 1453. Uh, yeah, I'd never been to the site. And I and I went to the site. And um, yeah, the English, I'm like, they're idiots. Like they walked into a death trap. And and I'm I'm still trying to get my head around what what the guy was thinking that he did that. And the the usually when you get on the 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 topography and I'm walking the site and I've got LIDAR and uh, you know, all the tools I use. Usually it's suddenly like, oh, that's what that's what they were thinking. And that's what they didn't know. Okay. Uh, Castillon, the more I walk around, the more I'm like, oh man, this what an idiot. Like this is just <laughs> like I gotta I gotta figure that one out. But uh yeah. So so it's it's it, to me it's very exciting. It it, it allows me to um, to engage in lots of different fields, whether it's, you know, looking for manuscripts, um, you know, trying to, to distinguish what somebody is talking about, all the different languages I have to use. It's, um, yeah, it's fun. It's good times. Uh, I, I know you've, uh, obviously, as everyone can tell, just listening to you talk about this, how much you love that work. Uh, tell me, what has studying this, like, taught you about military war and the human experience like are there some just general commonalities that you've learned about um, us as human beings yeah how how uh, how unchanging we are um you know before i really engaged in this kind of work it was it was easy to to think to think of the the you know antiquity and the middle ages as as them and not us um, it, you know, it's something in a museum, it's something uh, very distant and, you know, walking the ground of a battlefield and, you know, especially once we've kind of narrowed it down and, and it's like, this, this is it, right. You know, this is where it happened. And, um, you yeah, know, this is, this is where they were positioned, you know, and then, and then kind of getting yourself in, you know, this is where they died. Um, you know, I was at uh, uh, the Battle of Culloden. Um, when was that? Um, five days ago, six, I don't know. Well, days all blend together at this point. But I was at the Battle of Culloden up in Scotland. Now, that's that's an 18th century battle. That's Bonnie Prince Charlie and all that. Um, but, you, you know, we, we know where it is. We, we have the archaeology, right? We, we know where those those guys died, where the, the Jacobites went down. Um, shout, shout out to any Outlander fans out there. Uh, that one's, that one's in, in the Outlander series. I'm told I haven't watched it, but uh, there were lots of Outlander fans there. <laughs> They're like, is this where it happened? And they, yeah, that's where it happened. Uh, and your hero is a bad guy. But anyway, um, so... Yeah, that that site, knowing where it was and being there, I mean, it's it's haunting. And though you're you know you're talking about 
these dudes in kilts running around with axes and whatnot you know being there it's like this is what they were seeing you know and this is what they would have been feeling and, and this is why they're doing it and none of it is distant from us you know people want to uh you know want to live they want they want their way of life and that doesn't change and they have the same fears the same hopes and dreams that that, that we do i mean obviously they didn't know about zoom or anything like that right but you know outside of those technological changes and they're they're just us you know and and i i knew that at a kind of academic level but i didn't i didn't know that on a human level the way i do now yeah no that makes sense um you uh you included there was a picture of robert jordan's you know grave um and on the gravestone it said uh, father storyteller soldier singer those are very four specific words and very few words um what did you take away from seeing soldier as one of the four words used to describe jim or his uh life? i was so it's so fitting um you know he is a man who uh was steeped in war uh long before he went to it um you know i talk about this in in origins you know, I, I could have gone on and on uh, about it, but I was I was trying to use pages we had for for what I kind of figured would be of most interest to most people. Um, you know, his his uh, his family was one that had gone to war again and again and again and again, and uh, he grew up surrounded by that. Like that, this was duty. This was honor, uh, and when he himself, you know, then answers the call and goes to Vietnam, volunteers for it. Um, you know, the things he does and the things he experiences change him. As 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 they would for anyone. This isn't a um, you know make make him lesser or anything like that. This is this is human nature. War is 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 horrific. It truly is. And and anybody who's rah 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 about it doesn't know what war is right um or they're or they're covering up trauma basically because it's 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 awful business and uh even when it's necessary you can't deny that that horror and certainly he did not um and one of the things i i so enjoyed working on origins and going through all the notes and and everything he had was the that constant presence of of war, you know, even in the littlest ways that, that it's kind of there, it's, it's, it's in the air, it's steeped in it. Um, I didn't, I didn't include it in, in origins, but I actually had a, so, I, so I do, I do talk about, there's this one scene, um, that, that is sort of marked out. And he said, you know, that's from my experience. Um, and I, and I talk about that in the first well, it's chapter three or something like that. I can't remember now, but, uh, it's in those early chapters. I, I, I talk about that scene. I had actually written, I ended up cutting it, but I had a, a sequence in there where I said, you know, look, this, the, the, the fact that, you know, sort of here's an example and, and it's kind of just one over the course of a lot of books should not be taken to, uh, to to say that that's the only time this was there, right? It, the, the reason you, you, you can't pick it out constantly is because it's like constantly there, right? It's like oxygen, right? You, you, you can't sort of walk around and be like, oh, I caught some oxygen, you know, like, no, it's, it's, it's everywhere, it permeates. Uh, war, conflict permeates the wheel of time. And, and I, it did so because it kind of permeated his, his life, right? And, and his experiences. And so he, he's, it's sort of constant sort of background hum almost. And, and I think that's, um, to me, important to recognize. You know, you don't have to recognize that to enjoy the books by any means. Um, there's no one way to read these things. That's part of the reason that they're wonderful. But uh, for me, I, I cannot... I cannot pull them apart. I, I can't take 
you know, conflict um, and what he experienced and then what he knew about war away from the books because he he didn't ever stop studying it. He was, his, his, his library was like tons of military history books, like a ton of them, um, for which I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful at the level of, of a fan because I enjoy the books and that sort of thing. I'm also grateful as a professor at the Citadel because he gave a huge chunk of those books. Um, well, I shouldn't say he, Harriet, after his passing, gave those military history books. She gave them to the Citadel. Mm. And so, you know, very often when I go to to, to check out a book on the, the subjects I'm working on from from my library, it's it's, what, it's one of Jim's copies. It, you know, it says in there, you know, from from the estate. You know, if you haven't got writing in it, like that's like thanks, Jim. You know, it's like this sort of constant gift to my life uh, that he did that. Yeah, there's um, <clears throat> you can tell throughout the books that there's very real war, uh, an understanding of war, like in a very real way. You read a lot of fantasy books, uh, and the the wars, the battles are almost like romanticized, right? They're they're clean, they're um, uh, uh, they work, everything works out, you know, and and the numbers, you know, but the, the the two lines clash, and and the you know the king walks away victorious or whatever. And in the real time, you, you get a lot of really interesting moments that feel more real. Um, and, and the one that comes to mind is, um, this is spoilers up to book five. Of, oh, yeah. Uh, Fires should, of Heaven. Should I, let me uh, do a spoiler banner up. But, let me, um, uh, yeah, let me do a different one. I'll, uh, 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 let me, let me change it one real quick. Here we go. Okay, full book full spoilers, book spoilers uh, everyone. So spoiler up to book five, um, but the, the battle with, uh, uh, you mentioned the battle of Kuladin, uh, Kuladin a few minutes ago, but this battle with Kuladin in the books, uh, with the, in the Aiel, um, and Matt is um, fighting. He, he, he runs through the, this battle, uh, and, and at the end of the battle, Kuladin de is dead, and everybody's like, Matt, you killed him. And he's like, I, I don't remember this. And, it, and people, um, I've heard complaints over the years, I wish we had seen that fight. And I'm like, no, no, the point is, that's what war is like. When you're in the middle of it, you don't see the whole battlefield like you see in other, like other fantasy books. You see the fog of war. You don't, you just see what's immediately around you. You're just trying to survive and you come out the other side and everybody you fought was dead. Like, that's war, you know? And that to me feels like um, Jim, Robert Jordan probably experienced that specific feeling and encapsulated that in the books and that that war scene basically yeah no that's a that's a terrific example and and it's a, and it's a good example on on two accounts right as you say you know that fog of war and all that but also the way that narratives begin to be written about war even from the moment right i mean who who did actually kill him i mean right we, we don't really know right i mean we we yep. have what is said Right, but but like we didn't see it, right? So so is that and and, and this happens um, both intentionally and unintentionally, even in our historical sources, right? You know that oh, so and so, you know the big name guy did killed the other big name guy. Well, like like how they did? I mean, every once in a while, sure, but usually not. It's usually some schmuck that did it. Some schmuck, yeah, I was gonna yeah. Say. You know that that's a lucky arrow or something. You know, right? You know, some chance thing, but it gets attributed to the big name, mm -hmm. right? And that moves forward, and, and pretty soon that story begins. Um, sometimes intentionally, right? The big name wants to say, "I did it." You know, it wasn't the schmuck; I did it. Um, and sometimes that's a natural process um, of attribution. And 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 Jim was very much aware of this, the narrative complexity of understanding war. You know, that having been in it. Um, because of that fog of war, you're, you're dealing with fragments. And so even in the, the, the level of trying to comprehend what you did, you are constructing a narrative, you're constructing a story in order to take these jigsaw pieces and try and fit them into something, right? But it's never going to work. You don't have all the pieces. So you're just doing kind of the best you can, right? And if somebody else tells you something, you try and fit that in as well. And, and, and that's the, you know, the base reality of the experience of warfare. Um, and he knew that. And, and as I said, he tried to put that in. And I, yeah, I love it. It's, it's never, um, 
it's never clean, uh, you, you know, in terms of story and, and that's how it should be. Yeah. <clears throat> There's something interesting, you know, that I think about just as I age is just how tribal, you know, war is in the sense of, you know, who you're rooting for. You know, who do you want to lose? Who do you want to win a particular yeah. war, a fight, a battle, your side, you know, and how that, how that changes your, maybe your willingness to just overlook the horrific nature of a conflict because your desire for an outcome is much stronger than maybe your willingness to kind of uh, connect with what's happening. And I think Jordan, I don't know, I feel that way now as a reader. Like, you know, that we talk about war battles in the books like Dumai's Wells, you know, we where, you know, as a reader, it was like, yes, this thing happened and like kneel or you'll be knelt. You know, there's this idea of I wanted this outcome and I'm happy for this outcome. And sometimes the churning masses of bodies that are just, you know, the people that are killed in that moment, that's just a side effect. <laughs> that's that's the side thing that just happened to get the thing that you wanted out of it. And I feel like there's a reflection that's happening. I, I don't know if it was on purpose by Jordan or again, that there's that filter that you discuss in the book where it, is he wanting me to ask that question or is it just a natural outcome of his intuitively sharing a common story where I ask those questions of, is this a reflection of how much or how I view the value of human life? You know, is it more important that that I win because it's a, or that my side wins because it's symbolic of my ability to maintain my existence or something to that effect. So anyways, that, that goes through my head a lot. And I, and it, and it, and it comes back to something that you wrote early on and maybe the purpose somewhat that how I look at origins all the time. And I want to read something you wrote. You said, as we will learn one of the keys to how Jordan did what he did, and perhaps a key to why it has appealed to so many people is that he enmeshed our collective reality with his own personal faith, experience, and imagination. Between fate and free will, between chaos and order, he sought a balance of all. A wheel out of balance, after all, would be a wheel that spins awry. And you also said, there's nothing simple, nothing small in his work. The wheel of time is the height of seriousness, a vision that cuts to the heart of our cultural, political, and religious worldviews in a way that only fantasy can. It is not in the mirror, after all, that we see the truth of ourselves is in the eyes of strangers in unfamiliar lands. First of all, what's it like having somebody read your work back to you on a live stream? <laughs> um, honestly, I was like, damn, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't, I, that probably sounds horribly egotistical, but I was like, that's Damn, good rhythm. I, that's <laughs> nailed it. All right, all right. That's good. Well, it, it comes back to that question. I think that that key of understanding why, and that's what I wanted to ask you. You know, in what ways was Jim's experience in the military and that of his family part of that key, that vision of why the wheel of time has captivated millions of us? Like, is that part of the appeal that we're just not even seeing? Well, I mean, I, I, conflict is is part of the human experience, right? I mean, you know, he, whether it's in wartime or you know, bully on the playground, right? We've all experienced you know conflict in our lives, um, and and yeah, he was able to tap into that um, on a kind of macro scale, um, and obviously, he's dealing with you know the height you know, in the, in the kind of heightened dramatic, uh, you know, sense of, of, of war and battle and then producing that on these big scales of it's the last battle, you know, whatever, like it's, it's, it's that kind of big stuff, but that, that big stuff really only serves to, to touch little lessons of our, of our being. Um, we, we always, um, I think this is, not exactly what I was intending with those with those words, but this is part of why fantasy works so well, is because you 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 take it out of the commonplace and are are able to kind of take it to eleven, as Spinal Tap would say, um, and 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 deal with these concepts of conflict, good and evil, bad good, whatever, um, in a way that's sort of detached, and that enables you hopefully. To then mirror back to your reality and see the ways that this touches into your life. So, so yeah, I think 
I, I think absolutely was intended. Um, and, and absolutely it's part of why we gravitate to it because he's able to take these bits of our experience because he experienced them himself um, and able to put those on this grand scale where we, where we can kind of witness them uh, and then take them back into our, into our less exciting lives, hopefully, um, but nevertheless see the impact of it. Do you think then he was making a direct connection on purpose between the idea of conflict itself being the thing that's out of balance in the world? You know, I know we have the dichotomy of out of balance in many ways, but conflict is that enduring thread, right? Tam and Rand in the farmhouse through to the Tarwin's Gap, through to the end of each book, to the last battle, Tarmon Gaidan, right? Where we have all these ideas of battle and conflict that just endure. And this is coming to the end of an age. It, right. Is that the world out of balance where he's saying this is just the natural state and it's not an ending state of uh, humankind? Right. Well, I mean, this is one of the things, you know, again, full, full, full series yeah. spoilers. Full series spoilers, everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. This is one of the things that Rand has the chance to do is to take the conflict out um, and doesn't do. Right. I mean, you know, and, and this was something that um, that was envisioned from the beginning. That's not that's not something that um you know that, that that brandon came up with or anything like that that's you know as i talk about in the notes like that's that's their start like that from the beginning he's like this is where this is going to end up and people are going to want for the dragon reborn to kind of sterilize the system as it were um but he's smart enough to recognize that's not reality right that's that's not life um you have to have things in balance that means right that the death has to exist right because without it what's life right it means that dark has to exist because without it you have no light he, and 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 jordan he understood that through his through his life experience and all the rings he had, he had done um, you know before and since and i you know i think it encapsulates it just astonishingly well uh, i mean it's utterly beautiful the way he uh, the way he builds this entire series to basically make that point um, and hopefully make it so that we, um, you know, understand why that is the only choice, hmm. right? That we understand that that's, that that's right. You know, it is right. Um, even though, you know, perhaps at the beginning, we may not have felt that way. Right when we open up the eye of the world, we might have thought, "Well, you know, I hope that the bad guy gets destroyed," um, you know, and for, you know, for now and forever. And hopefully, by the end, we recognize why things end up the way they do, because um, because it's right. Hmm. Yeah, I, it, it's interesting. It, it be, again, it, it's a totally different experience from when I was fifteen starting to read this, right? And as an, as, as an adult um, going through that, like, yeah, it was right. Uh, it, was it an intuitive story? Like, do you think the gift of him being a storyteller in this way, understanding how to communicate conflict was his gift where this endured versus some other book that an author was like, well, I understand this lesson too, and I'm going to write about it. I want to follow up on that real quick. The, there's a lot of uh, veterans out there who have seen war, who have seen combat, and who uh, don't handle it well, right? They they struggle with being integrating into society. They feel like they don't deserve success or deserve access to a, a normal life. Um, there are veterans out there who, who just struggle and struggle and struggle just to be humans again after they've been in combat. And, and Jim comes back from war, and he... I'm sure he struggled uh, a little bit, but or a lot maybe, but like he turned it into this story that we all love and 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 communicated this in in another way. So, um, you know, yeah, to echo Matt's question, like, what is it that Jim's bringing to this? How is this like taking his life experiences and and turning it into the story that we have, different from other people who couldn't do that? Yeah, I, you know, to some degree, I don't. You know, why did this one hit? And yeah. And, and another one didn't, um, you know, look, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, you know, publishing and, uh, you, you know, is a weird 
thing, right? And 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 you can have, uh, I mean, really any media, right? Movies are the same way. Music is the same way. You can have this utterly brilliant work that gets totally unnoticed. Um, you know, my my work comes to mind, um, and uh, and then you can, and then you can have uh, utter tripe that gets everybody's reading it. Um, I could name plenty of names. And, and every once in a while, you get something that is brilliant and everybody reads it, right? You know, so why is that the way it is? I, I mean, honestly, I, I have no idea. I wish I knew because then I would try and work the alchemy for my own career. But what, what is clear is that is that the way that this thing was evolved, um, you know, you, you, not only do you have these sort of... Um, basic destination right the basic journey in mind but, but obviously it evolved in the course of his writing of it um and the way that that he was able to input himself made it something that could tap into all of these life experiences that people have whatever they are right whether they're approaching it thinking about war or they're approaching it thinking about love or they're thinking about like you know gender i mean who knows and you can kind of like get story out of it that means something to you i, I will say i think in that evolution, and I, again, this is one of these things I couldn't get too far down the rabbit hole, though I, tr I tried to give pieces so that people would see that the rabbit hole was there. Um, you, you know, he wanted to tell his own story. Um, this is the reason he had not written under his own name. He had planned to do that. I'm going to tell you my story, and that will be under my name. Hmm. Everything else will be a pseudonym. That's the reason for the pseudonyms. When Wheel of Time goes like a rocket, I think there's a, a, a high degree to which he brought that, you know, I'm going to tell my story even more into this. I mean, it was always it was always there, but it became that much more um, permeated with himself because this is now going to be it, right? This is the reason I say. Um, you know, if you want to know him, read the wheel of time, hmm. right? You know, in this, he, 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 that's him. He's there. Uh, every time I pick up, pick up the books, I'm, I'm in conversation with the man and, and so are we all. And that, that's really amazing. It's really cool. Hmm. I, the, uh, it brings back the. The foretelling, I was, as I was thinking about this conversation, uh, I couldn't get away from the foretelling in Lord of Chaos where, you know, you have the lion sword, the dedicated spear, she who sees beyond, etc. And then there's the line, the great battle done, but the world not done with battle, right? And there's something like you read that and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, like, that, no, no, that's, that's not how this is supposed to work, right? Like the great battle's done. And uh, just that, just that like phrase itself like you said knowing robert jordan reading the books like that foretelling that just that one sentence to me like has so much more meaning now the great battle done but the world not done with with battle um and uh the future teeters on the edge of a blade right and you think oh maybe he's talking about the future of the great battle right and then you're like no the future always teeters on the edge of a blade right like and that awareness, uh, it speaks, like you said, really deeply as you age, right? And you, maybe you do come even more familiar, like Brian said, maybe you actually serve in the military. Maybe you have family and um, generations that are attached to it. But just as you age, you see this unfold with your own communities across the world in many ways of that, that line is just so real. Like it, yeah. it, it's not, whether or not the great battle, right? the world wars we've had the great battles but the world's never done with battle and how yeah how big is that for our understanding how we how we understand being human and living in this world um and it also reminds me of my one of my favorite quotes when robert jordan was asked to describe the books i've said this one so many times they were gonna like describe it in six six words and he's like uh, cultures clash worlds change cope and I did it, even did it in five, basically, or something like that, you know. But cultures clash, right? Worlds change. Um, so, yeah, just it, it's so interesting because I never really 
understood that as I read the books originally, right? And and really came to appreciate. And that's why I do. Uh, Mike, I hope you feel that from fans, which is from the origins of the time, like that, that idea that we can get to know him. He didn't write that. He didn't write that book, that autobiography, right? But, but this is, this became somewhat that is what you're, I feel like you've communicated to us, right? It's the things that meant the most and the things he understood and the experiences he had translated into this book. And we can read lines like that and really commune with how he felt about the world. Yeah. And I'm, and I, I'm, I'm, and I'm glad you brought that up. I, I love that foretelling it. He was so good with the foretellings. Um, you know, it's, and, and I think all of them, uh, like you, I first read through, I read one way and then, you know, later on, I'm like, Oh man, there was another layer there. You know, Oh, there's another layer. And, and that's the way the books are. Right, they are they are this this amazing uh, topography, right? Where the where the surface is doing one thing, but underneath it, there's you know this other action happening, right? These these tectonic forces that are shaping that topography that uh, that we may not be aware of. We don't have to be aware of, but yeah. if you do become aware of it, either from your own life experience or getting older or or, you know, if you, you read Origins of the Wheel of Time and it suddenly exposes that to you, like whatever conversation at WatCon or whatever, you know, you, you suddenly see there's these other layers, that that's awesome too, right? And and it's 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 a rare thing to be able to write a a story that has that kind of effect um, and has that capability and that and that they're all consistent, right? It's not like one uh, is in odds with another or breaks another or whatever. They all work in concert. Uh, it, you know, reading and reading the drafts, you can see him working on that process. Um, you know, slowly getting, you know, let me get this in, let me get this in uh, to get that full effect. It's, it's, it's really, he was good. He was good at it. He was good. You know what? He was a good writer. Um, yeah. Somebody should read his books. <laughs> yeah, like. yeah. Somebody should yeah. somebody should put them out there. Um, yeah, there's a there's a uh, uh, one of the best things about the Wheel of Time is it's the, the, the title, the Wheel of Time. Time is a wheel; it's circular; it repeats itself. And and one of the reasons that that's important to this conversation is like we always knew we are, from page one we've always known the last battle is not the last battle. Um, because we know that's just the end of the age, right? And there's going to be another age, and there's going to be more war, and there's going to be more conflict. And so, um, you know, when you do get to that scene in A Memory of Light, where Rand has to choose between a world of no war and no conflict, and a war of like total conflict, and then all, all the spectrum in between, like you knew the no conflict one was not going to be valid because time's a wheel; it's going to repeat itself. And this is like layering of of that in there. Um, and it also relates back to the, the real world. You know, we look at some battles and we go, this is the great war, man. This is it. There's no more war after this. Like, and then we get, you know, imagine like meeting a, a time traveler from World War One and be like, oh, yeah, I fought in the, in the World War. And they're like, which one? And they're like, which one? You mean there were two? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, there was the great war was supposed to be the war that ends all wars. And then we had another one 10 years later, you know, it's like that's not that's how the world works and and history repeats itself and or rhymes maybe uh, history rhymes um and uh, uh i think the, the the wheel of time conceit the the idea of you know history doesn't necessarily repeat itself but it rhymes and and you you, you will always have more like you said at the top of this 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 chat like humans don't change we don't change like we're fundamentally the same people we were 500 years ago a thousand two thousand five thousand years ago just with different technology and the the wheel of time like reinforces that. And I think if you approach this series, if you read through the series with that in mind, like a lot of these references, a lot of these prophecies uh, change um, and, and they mean something different because you know, that's not the last battle. The battle, you know, there will always be more battle. Everything always forever eaters on the edge of a blade. Um, I was in a battle yesterday uh, it was the battle of the dishwasher and how, and, and I lost, 
um, in, in the battle because I put the dishes in wrong. So, like, there's always conflict. There's always war. Um, and sometimes you live with the opposing general, and that is uh, life. <laughs> yeah. Some some conflicts are interesting to read about and hear about. Some yeah. aren't. <laughs> yeah. uh, Wait, are you saying my battles are not interesting? I'm just I saying they're, they're, they're terribly interesting. Yeah, that's that's really that's really great, Brian. Yeah, no, tell us some more about that. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, no, it. it uh, yeah, it, and 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 the wheel of time conceit, like in the process, also enables him to um, to keep using historical things, right? I mean, which mm -hmm. is just so so much mm. fun, um, right? You know that uh, that even these you know throwaway lines, you know, a, a, a dream that Matt has about a about a battle in the past, right? As a past general, um, yeah, they're like based on real battles, right? You know, th those are not. Well, almost all of them. There's a couple I haven't figured out, um, which infuriates me to no end um, because they've they've got to be based on a historical battle, and and I don't know which one it is, and I and I and I hate myself for that. Um, but the book had to go to print, and so it went into print without them. But, now, are are um, you holding on to these as like you're because you want to discover them, or are you telling people? Are you sharing with them? This is the battle. This is one of them that I don't know, and I'd love it for people to jump in and uh, figure it out. With let me them. see if I can find one. Okay. I have a, I have a look. Uh, oh, I can't show you that. Uh, <laughs> I was like, that's blurred. That's blurred. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of them I have, I have uh, since figured out. So, um, like, uh, da, 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 da. Where's where's a good one? Uh, uh, that, that one I figured out. Um, <laughs> yeah, that one that one's a that one's a neat one. Um, yeah, uh, well, like the last stand of Mendenhar. Um, you know that's a, a you know a song that Matt remembers uh, mm -hmm. being son of the time of Archer Hawkwing. Um, you know, uh, our, our boy here in the chat will uh, will know that comes from uh, the heroic efforts of Thomas Mendenhall in 1776, uh, which is where Eludra gets her name. Um, so yeah, like that one, okay, know that one. But the Battle of Midian's Ford, for instance, hmm. like, I'm not sure what he's using there, right? Like, uh, you know, Gideon versus the Midianites from the Bible. Okay, that could be a thing there with Midian's Ford. All right, that, that could be a thing. And and there's plenty of Ford um, uh, battles. But but I can't I can't sort of connect it together enough to be like, okay, that one's we can feel certain about that one. Yeah. Um, there wasn't enough in the notes. There wasn't. So I just have like. And in my, I have like a, a list of, yeah, all these things that are still unknown. Um, and that, that, that's, that's, that's in the list. Um, there it is. He was, he was interested in Fords. Hmm. Um, Jim was, uh, cause he also has the battle of, uh, coin die Fords, which, um, that one, that one I figured out and that one, if we do an expanded version of origins, that one will be in it. Um, so as will more information about Dumai's Wells. I mean, this, this seems like an appropriate time to ask our audience, uh, about 200 of them said, I asked them, have you read origin of the wheel of time? Michael, I don't want to, I don't know. You might want to look away from this poll, but only 50% of you, I don't know what's wrong with you people out there. Uh, this is your opportunity. Hopefully you're watching this I... and saying, what are these people talking about? I didn't realize there was a place where you could read all about this origins of the wheel of time. Um, is I'm, where you I'm can okay. Read them. <laughs> I'm okay. It's fine. Um, but yeah, no, that, that, I, I think all of us, at least here in chat would love to eventually hear more about the things that you've, uh, that you studied. Uh, s speaking about Robert Jordan's, this idea of uh, the conflict but they being there and Robert Jordan talking about his experiences. You did quote uh, from one of the interviews. I think he did uh, talking about this as he said, he said, I've certainly used some things from Vietnam. I know what it's like to have someone try to kill me. 
me in particular, not some random guy, me. I know what it's like to kill someone. I know how the first time feels and how that is different from the fifth or the tenth. These things certainly went into the characters I've written. That wasn't deliberate. Who you are is constructed in large part from what you have experienced and how you reacted to those experiences. Whatever you write is filtered through who you are. So the influence has to be there. So when he said that wasn't deliberate, I was I was curious, did you, I mean, that's how he felt in that moment. Did you find that there was more correlation? Was there, did you ever sense like, okay, this uh, more than just maybe one instance was deliberate where he was trying to tell us something? Or did you feel like after all your research, it was like, no, this was just, he wanted to tell a story and it was filtered through his experiences. I, I mean, I think it's a, l a little bit of both. Uh, you know, part of what he's responding there is, you know, if you're looking for specific instances, um, you know, as we talked before, and there's there's really only one, uh, which I talked about in the book. Yeah. Um, and that one's, it, it is deliberate because he, he put it in the book and talked about it. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, but other than that, you know, what he's talking about, and I, and I, I find it really interesting the way he, he phrases it there. Um, almost the exact same phrasing is what you get when Tolkien is asked about whether or not the Lord of the Rings has anything to do with the World War, uh, with World War I, um, and then World War II. Um, and Tolkien himself was at the Battle of the Somme in World War I, which is the, the meat grinder, as Tolkien called it. Utterly horrific. I mean, just truly horrific, the Battle of the Somme. And, and it is absolutely in Lord of the Rings. It's, you know, I've written an article on this called The Shell-Shocked Hobbit, talking about the fact that Frodo is, is, has PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how much of that did, did did Tolkien sit down and say, I'm going to write a story in which the main character has post-traumatic stress disorder or what he would call, he would have called it shell shock, but we would call it PTSD now. Um, did he set down deliberately to do that? I don't think so. Um, is that what he did? Yes, <laughs> that's what he did. Um, and and in, in large part because of what he himself had experienced and gone through, I, I, I don't think he could almost help it, right? This is this is what happened. Now, are there key moments in which, in which those things are 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 coming so close that, that it sure looks like it's deliberate? Um, yeah, you know the 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 Nazgul when the Nazgul scream, and and men go mad. Um, I guess, spoiler alerts for the Lord of the Rings as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, look, that's what he's, what is really going on there is at the Bala Psalm, the, the sound of incoming shells would make that screaming sound. And pretty quickly, the men in the trenches would, would start to kind of, you know, react, right? They would go mad hearing that sound because they thought, you know, well, one of us is about to die. Um, well, you know, that echo, what are you going to call it is, is, is there. Was Tolkien himself conscious of that, um, right? I am going to make the Nazgul like, you know, incoming rounds in the trenches. Or was he trying to think of something scary and that kind of came in and he sort of was unconscious of it? We, we don't really know which it is, right? Because yeah. Tolkien, I've, I've been through the Tolkien archive. Um, there's, no, there's no piece of evidence that I was able to find where, where he says, you know, I did this very intentionally. Um, instead he says like that quote you just gave from Jordan, uh, you know, well, you can't help but be, but be, uh, have your own life experience fall into it because you're writing. And of course it's part of the, the sort of the soup of everything. You know, this is the exact same language said the exact same way. Um, and I find that tremendously interesting near as I can tell, uh, Jim had never read the um the, the 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 piece where Tolkien talks about this so was this just kind of great minds think alike um maybe I don't know but it is uh it is fascinating to me that these these two these two folks who, who had undergone uh seen pretty horrific things and and 
then wrote these fantasies, you know, responded that way. Um, you know, Tolkien, you know, I've kind of hinted, I, I think, um, probably at some level had suffered from PTSD. Um, and writing Frodo, writing Frodo's experiences was a way of, of getting that out. And, and, you know, kind of grappling with it, which is, which is something we often talk about doing in response to trauma is, is to write through it. And I think he was doing that at, at some level. Uh, you know, Jordan may have been doing the same. We don't, we don't know. Um, but it, it, it is striking that, that both of them responded the same way. I think I think most authors would respond that way as well. Or you, you probably do about Shards of Heaven as well. Like you, we, uh, I could ask questions about, you know, which character is most like you, and your answer might be, well, they're all kind of like me because I wrote them. You know, like anytime you ask a fantasy author that question, you kind of get that same answer because it's kind of true. Like you, they all come from you, and you you filter your own experiences through however they uh, the characters are, are portrayed. Um, so I do think, I, I think it's interesting that the wording was very, very similar, but I do think you'd get basically the same answer from, from almost anyone. Um, but I guess what I am interested in is like, do you think how, what percentage of like the events in the wheel of time you think were like directly inspired by something that Jordan experienced in war versus like you know, uh, maybe something he just made up. Um, so like, like we, I mentioned the cool didn't scene earlier, like that's, I think that's clearly someone who ex experienced a frenzied fog of war moment, um, even if that particular combat sequence wasn't directly inspired. But then you can think about like other scenes where maybe this is clearly like related to an event that he talked about at some point, like how much of that do you think is direct versus indirect? That's a great question. I don't know that I've, I've ever thought about trying to run numbers on it. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I will say that when it comes to named events, anyway, um, the vast majority of them have connective tissue, right? Um, of, of of one kind or another, right? They they have that connective tissue, um, and the ones that don't. I'm, I'm guessing do, and I'm just too ignorant to know what they are. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, for all that I've tried to get, get close to, uh, to his mind, you know, I don't have his mind. And, and so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that there are connections. I just don't have them. So, you know, that's, that's my fault. Um, but yeah, when it comes to the, to the, the, the details of action, it, it's always this mix, right, of not just the, you know, historical uh, precedent within the wheel, but also the, these amazing characters that he's created, and also his, his personal experience. So I don't know that there's, there's one, that there's, there's any spot where it's all one or the other, right? It's it's all kind of mixed, and that's again part of what makes it, you know, I think I think powerful and resonant is that you may not have the same life experience, but you know a similar story, or you don't know the story, but you have a similar personal life experience, and kind of whichever way that that this um, that you attach into it works, you know, for you as the reader. And it obviously is going to vary from moment to moment and event to event. Um, so yeah, put you know when you put it together, it's it's what makes this a you know for lack of a better word, kind of a magical thing. Um, you know that it that it works that way, um, and thus can 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 speak to us. You know, I mean, de decades later, in the case of obviously the first books. Uh, and I suspect we'll continue to speak to people for many, 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 many decades to come because people don't change. And so it's going to still remain relevant, uh, you know, many, many years from now. Um, you know, our children's children will probably be reading it and find resonance despite the fact that they're reading it through their implants or whatever the hell, 
uh, mechanism they're getting it through at that point, they'll be human too. And so they'll have those same, those same touchstones. I think at least some of what you're getting at is this idea that um, reality, we talked about it earlier, like reality can kind of sometimes be stupid, stupid things like result in war ending. Um, and maybe the reality is not as interesting. And so you can have like an, a, a real event that you embellish or you tell through a different lens and you get a more interesting story. Um, or, or sometimes the other way around where like, if I told you what really happened, you'd never believe me. So I have to like, pull it back into something a little more believable that's also entertaining and like the books yeah. first and foremost are about entertainment right it's not about like here's my perspective on war to the world you know this is this right. is like i want to tell a story that is fun and entertaining and so there's there's almost certainly a blend everywhere of lived experiences embellishments entertainment and and taking things and making them believably believably entertaining and interesting without being outlandish and, and crazy. And I think Robert Jordan did this fantastic job of doing that in ways that a lot of authors don't. Yeah, I wholly agree. I wholly agree. Why are you talking to me? We should just be, uh, you should just be talking, Brian. <laughs> so I brought, that's why we brought Brian today. Um, let's, yeah. let's jump to a, like maybe a little bit lighter, uh, side of this conversation. Stubble McShave. Thank you very much. He asked this question. So did, so did, so did Joe in chat. What battle did Michael and Brian, you can answer this question too, geek out about the most when it comes to the wheel of time. Like what's your, do you have a favorite battle, um, in the wheel of time? Do my as well. Is it? Why is that? Yeah. Um, so do my as well as, uh, there, there's there's several reasons uh, in in no particular order. Um, one is what I talk about in Origins of the Wheel of Time, the 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 kind of layer cake of um, historical pieces that he built that battle out of um, is is just brilliant. I mean, it is mm -hmm. just brilliant. And um, so on, kind of like a on my sort of professional level, I'm just like that is awesome. You know, that is so cool that you took that, you took that, and you took that. Oh my God, look what you did. Um, so that just on my geek uh, academic level makes me, makes me seriously happy. Um, on a geek uh, Jordan level, I guess would be the best way to describe it. Um, the, the, the fact that he was going to have this big battle for, uh, uh, at Wells um was from the beginning um this is not in origins um if there's an expanded origins it'll be in there um but he had an intention to have a, a, this big event at the wells from the beginning mm. um he didn't know what they were gonna be called yet but they were gonna be the wells um and so i find that very cool um and i find it very cool like like why was he doing Right. Um, maybe a maybe a WatCon. I'll like read the expanded Dumai's entry. Did you say you at WatCon you will you will read that? That's a that's a great idea. That's a yeah. great idea. <laughs> I, said, I said I said maybe. Oh. I said, mm. oh. What's that? Your 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 microphone cut out just there for a second. Um, oh. Anyway, we're looking forward to it. <laughs> right. Okay. Cool. Um, cheers. So I, I find I find that very interesting. And I also find it very interesting, you know, that moment, as, as, as you actually said earlier, Matt, is one in which I, I think a, a, a lot of people read, at least initially, as this, like, moment of glory, right? This, you know, like, hell yeah, you know, like, boom, take that, you know, like, there's, there's that that urge to magnificence, if you will, and that, that that should, should be entirely undercut. Um, that it's, it's not, it's, that is, that is a, that is horror. I mean, it is straight up horror. Um, and the, and the, and, and I, and I love that. I, I, I love that, that, that he managed this, this climactic moment that 
you you want to cheer and it's just completely undercut and the more you read of the books the more you know that it's undercut the more you recognize what a what a tragedy and horror this way like oh god that's beautiful that is just so amazing to me uh and and i don't there are other moments that that kind of do that but some somehow none of them do it for me personally the way yeah. Dumais Wells does so so Dumais Wells yeah uh, Brian is there one that you are, have a favorite of, of? Um, I've already mentioned it several times it's the 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 fight against Kulod and, and Fires of Heaven I think it's to me it's the one that I that feels like I'm actually in a war um, mm-hmm. Dumais Wells is like cool from the it feels very cinematic to me it feels like I will really 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 want to see Dumais Wells on screen like if we do not get that in the show, we riot. Uh, <laughs> that is what happens. Um, but the, but the the one that I really enjoy reading the most is the Kuladin scene. I think it's 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 a one person's view of a, a, a of the battle, um, and, and it feels different than every other battle scene I've ever read, which is usually a uh, bird's eye view from a commander's perspective. Um, and so I really 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 like the the Kuladin scenes um or the, the fight of matt and Kuladin and pirates of heaven good answer. for me good answer for me it's a lot of just Thank like you. the little i don't know you can't call them like battles i don't know maybe you do with like like i said rand and tam and the farmhouse like it's the it's when he gets really on the ground in the mm-hmm. mind of the person in the moment with an individual conflict during the overall conflict you know those are like i don't know why those are so I engage with them so much, but it's, uh, yeah, maybe it's just this feeling of it's, it's personal, <laughs> right? Like you're out there. I've never been on a battlefield, but this is what it's telling me. I and mean, right. This is what I understand. What I would understand is in the moment it, the battle happening is the one you are just in the midst of with one or two, maybe three, however many people it is to survive that moment. And there's something visceral about that. Like where the step back, of a conflict is less interesting to me and it's that person's journey <laughs> into that battle and out out of it that is the most impactful to me so those moments for me are like when he does that i'm just like oh wow yeah like i feel like i'm like i'm feeling all of the emotions of that if that makes sense yeah. he does that really well no totally and, um, totally yeah um, uh yeah we uh, yeah agreed agreed now, now you brought up this i i I'm sure it's because you saw somehow a list of questions I I wanted to ask you about, but uh, you <laughs> no you didn't see this, but but you just brought up this idea of the horrific nature of war, and you you say this in the books, right? Um, I think we all recognize academically war is horrific, right? Um, you might see pictures and you go, oh, okay, yeah, that is that is horrific itself. Do you think that in the books themselves? Robert Jordan conveys the horror of those moments. Like you just talked about, he did this somehow really well. Like, is he, is he giving us the horror of war or is he giving us a, I don't know how to say it. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Is, are we getting the horror of war in the wheel of time? Uh, No. Okay. In the, in the sense that um, you don't want it. Um, you know, so for, uh, so for example, I mentioned, I mentioned Waterloo. It's the anniversary of Waterloo. Yeah. Um, there are multiple like, eyewitness accounts of what happened at Waterloo and what, and what the aftermath in particular was like, you know, what, what did that field look like after it was done? Um, most of those, well, I should say far as I know, all but one of them um, came weeks afterwards. And the field had already been mostly cleared. And it, and even then, the carnage in the, and how horrible it was was just absolutely dramatic. And it's, and it's almost impossible to read. Hmm. Um, just recently, um, like the news came out today, um, that there was a Scotsman a Scotsman named Thomas Q, I think his name was, um, was a colleague of mine at, at Glasgow found this, um, his name was Tom, Tony Pollard, shout out to Tony, um, found this 
um, bundle of papers, um, and they're the they're this man's eyewitness account of coming to the battlefield, like within hours, essentially, like the bat like the battle ended that night. He came the next morning mm-hmm. um, and walked through it, and he wrote about what he saw. And that account was never published. He wanted to publish it. Nobody would publish it. Part of that was social status. He wasn't, uh, you know, he was just kind of a, you know, a nobody. Um, whereas Sir Walter Scott wanted to write about it. And so Sir Walter Scott got to write about it. Right. And Sir Walter Scott made his up. Um, this guy was actually there. And, um, and what he writes uh, is, yeah, nothing that will ever be on film. Um, cause we shouldn't put it on film. Um, we, no one should have to see that. Um, tr- I mean, you know, tr- truly no one should have to see that. No one should have the, the, just the witness, witnessing the, the aftermath. Um, t- Tony suggests that, that he, that he has PTSD, that the, um, that this guy is just from seeing the aftermath, um, much less having lived through it. And, and he actually goes back to the field something like 19 times. Um, and part of that is because he's seeing the field recover and in so doing is sort of like recovering in his own mind by seeing life return to the field and seeing, you know, bodies get taken care of and so that that's like healing the damage from the initial view um so yeah the the reality isn't in these books you don't want the reality in these books like like they you you don't um it's 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 too it's too awful i mean this is kind of goes back to what i said earlier um you know you to to, to study war, to experience war is, is to loathe it. Um, it's, it's, it's so horrible. I mean, it, you know, it truly is. I mean, I've, you know, I tell people like, you know, I study war and they, they think, you know, oh, you're a warmonger, you know, like, oh, you know, and like, are you kidding? Like, are you kidding? I study this stuff. I know it. So there's no way I want anyone to ever experience it. It's just awful. And, and Jim knew that, he knew that truth. And mm-hmm. he knew, and I, and I think did a very good job of understanding, you know, to go back to the word, the balance mm-hmm. between this is what it is, th- this is what you need to understand what you need to understand, right? Uh, and, and, and to get what you need of it. Right. You know, because because we can't we can't go through it in reality. Right. You know, this is um, I remember when Game of Thrones was such a big deal. and I was getting interviewed, you know, and, and every interview was the same. Like, how real is Game of Thrones? Uh, so you're a you're a medieval warfare guy. How real is Game of Thrones? And of course, like <laughs> it has dragons. So not very. Yeah. Um, but. But also, um, you know, when people would say, you know, I just, I just hate that they made it so bloody, you know, or so it's so violent. And I'd be like, well, it's, if you're looking for reality, it's not bloody enough. It's not violent enough, right? That, that, that this is even in its most horrific moments, generally sanitized compared to, you know, what, what actually happens in a melee battle. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't put that on screen. Um, you know, I, even in giving talks, I, I am very, uh, uh, reticent to get too far into Hmm. what it's like, because I don't, like, I don't want to be responsible for somebody's nightmares, right? That's, that's not good. Um, I want, I want to educate, right? I want to, you know, you're curious about how something happened. I'll, I'll educate. Um, but you know, we don't, we don't want to get too far into it. So, so yeah, on the one hand, war is absolutely there and it's built out of his experience and it's, and it taps into it. Yes, yes, yes. Is reading the books effectively the same thing as, as the experience of what that's really like? 
no. And yeah. thank God. <laughs> like, good yeah. thing. It's a good thing. I think we we basically get like a PG-13 version of war with the Wheel of Time for the most part. And he, he does this very intentionally with like the greatest Blade Master, Lan Mandragor, and like you don't really get blow by blow descriptions of what Lan is doing. He slips into wades through the rushes and cat crosses the courtyard and these like euphemisms that let your brain fill in what he's doing. And like Jordan doesn't really go into those just I mean, that he does that very intentionally. Um and and maybe maybe to like PG the the fight, but also like it lets your brain kind of fill in the gaps there. Um and and fundamentally the wheel of time is a story about hope. It's about hope and uh, uh, optimism toward the future and, and things like that versus the grimdark genre with like Joe Abercrombie's first law and, and Malazan and things like that, where the, the whole theme is like life sucks and then you die and then it sucks some more. That's, that's the whole grimdark genre. And like, yeah. if you want it, if you want the horrors of war, go read that because you will not walk away from a battle going, Ooh, that was fun. You will be like, that was the most horrible thing I've ever read in my life. And even that is still a sanitized version of real, real war um it goes back to like are we entertaining or are we teaching people about war because you can do both but um yeah but yeah and and uh what, what do you think about robert jordan doing that like euphemism combat uh with lan and rand with the sword forms and things like that did you think that was interesting yeah i mean and i think you kind of hit it on the head it allows you to kind of zoom in but also kind of zoom out right you know you're like oh oh i'm, I'm right there but I don't need to go through exactly what that blade is doing to human flesh or trollic flesh or whatever. Like we don't have to get there. I mean, obviously at moments we do, but, sure. um, but yeah, as you said, it is this kind of like PG PG 13 version that, that nevertheless gives that impression of being much more happening. And and of course that's because as you said, you, you input that from your, from your mind. Um, right. You know, you, you input what jaws looks like, but long before you see the shark, uh, the same kind of process is happening there. And there's and there's great um, uh, great utility to that as a writer, right? You know that that I'm going to allow the reader to fill in blanks, right, and and fill in, and it's going to mean that much more to them. Um, at what at what level those are sort of conscious acts as a storyteller, or just innate impulses, right? That's instinct happening. Don't know. Um, don't know. Obviously, it varies moment to moment, person to person. But um, whether that was something he was consciously constructing or just came naturally to him, uh, in the end, the execution is the same, which is that it's it works really, really well, I think. Yep, I agree. Uh, Chad is asking some questions about what you think about war in different media. Um, and so I'm going to ask you, uh, do you have any, are there any movies or TV shows where you think war is depicted very realistically? Um, and then sort of flip side, which may be the same answer, it might be different, but are there any movies or TV shows where you think war is depicted very well, um, even if it's not realistic? Like Braveheart, is that, you know, realistic? Uh, what about The Last King? I don't know. What What do you think? <laughs> Vikings. <laughs> there is, somebody there specifically is not, asked about Braveheart, so that's not coming from me. That's somebody else. Okay, Braveheart. There's not enough booze in this apartment for me to get through. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Braveheart is so bad, so bad. I have a fun story uh, about Braveheart, but I'll tell you. I'll tell you later. Um, well, I, okay. So I will say this about Braveheart: it sucks. Um, <laughs> It's a professional opinion. Professional yeah. opinion there. Um, no, it's, I mean, historically, like you can enjoy the movie or whatever. I love the soundtrack. The soundtrack's fantastic. Um, but, you, you know, you know, Braveheart does have moments of um, well, glimpses, I guess, where where things are kind of right. Like his, his execution at the end, um, when, he's, when he's being taken actually up to the platform um there is uh there's a little person on the platform with a with like a dummy and is 
doing things to the dummy you see in the background if you watch closely um that's what is actually done to wallace so he's like disemboweling him and doing things to his genitals and stuff like that like that like that's what happens to wallace um and in fact that that actually is kind of like a historical thing that to to get the crowd pumped up i guess for you know what they're about to see you sort of like do a pantomime of what they're about to say. Oh, and then we're going to do this to him. And then we're going to do this to him. And then we're going to pull his entrails out. Da, da, da. Like, hmm. and so they kind of do a pantomime. And so you see that now when it actually comes to, to Mel Gibson, right. They, they don't, they don't show it. Um, right. They, I guess when he does his final shout freedom, right. It sort of implies what they're, doing to him down below but doesn't show it um probably for good reason doesn't show it um but but yeah sort of in that moment it's like okay you, sure. like you kind of got it right you know like it's kind of there yeah. um but yeah typically you know medieval movies anyway i mean people who've read my medieval movie reviews know I, you know it's just like a constant like what the hell are you doing like that's not yeah. right uh, you know, <laughs> at all by anybody, and why is nobody wearing a helmet? Um, nobody important <laughs> wearing it. Yeah, you know, people are wearing helmets, but they're not important. Um, you know, like that's that's just disturbing as all get out. Um, you know, I was the, the filmmakers do certain periods better than others. Hmm. Uh, I think Spielberg. Did, he did a tremendous thing with um, with his kind of World War II oeuvre um, in trying to introduce an, an unsanitized. I mean, it's still it's still sanitized, but but lightly sanitized. I would guess. Uh, look at what World War II was like, um, and so we get that a lot better than I think most conflicts. He really he really he did he did a good job of that i mean you know yeah we can look at it and say well that's not quite right that's not quite right. but i think relative it's much much closer um the uh it, you know and, and things like that like the band of brothers uh show uh did fantastic in moments i mean really fantastic there are sequences in there that um that I that I've watched multiple times just because I think they capture they so well capture some aspect of of warfare in that moment um in the uh the the early capture of Breckert Manor um which is which is just after the guys get um onto the Cotentin Peninsula uh and and uh, Lieutenant Winters and a, a small band of guys has to have to go capture these guns or disable the guns I should say disable the guns at Breckert Manor. And, and that is, it does a great job of the kind of chaos of it. Um, the, you know, the randomness of it, the, you know, the sound of it, the, the, the shock of it, it, it does, it does a good job of, of all of that. Um, so that's, so that's good. So that's good. Nobody's done ancient warfare, right? Yet. Hmm. Um, which that sucks. Not even Troy with uh, Brad Pitt and uh, <laughs> I thought that was no, no, okay, nah. nah. Moving on. Uh, Next, I have, <laughs> I have, I have a, a student of mine. Um, there's no way he's he's uh, he's, he's listening, but uh, uh, Cadet Cadet Dante, uh, if he loves that movie, um, is is convinced that's one of the greatest movies of all time and uh was like like for like two or three years i had him as a student was like he was fighting tooth and nail to convince me that that was a good movie and i and i just i just wasn't having any of it i don't know i'm like <laughs> no man brad pitt's too pretty it's not okay <laughs> there you go um do you like maybe stepping back at the genre itself um a lot of the fantasy i read growing up and maybe it's just because i I was I liked the maybe epic stories, but a lot of them dealt with war, right? That was kind of like 
I read about war a lot, <laughs> like just as a little kid, like in in fantasy. Do you think there's a reason why it is? I mean, is it just generally conflict and war, and that's life, and so you find it in fantasy, or do you think that fantasy itself is just a genre that uh, a, that attracts that story or that that trope? I guess in some ways. I, I think part of it is a trope, right? This is something we do a lot, um, for better or worse. Right. And, and like, uh, you know, as writers, you, you, if you do an epic fantasy, you, you, you have to deal with that trope. You have to either Hmm. go along with it and give everybody a big battle or, or you got to deny them that, right. Or, or tease them that you're going to give it to them and then don't, um, you know, I, I I know some writers who pulled that move, right. You know, you're going to, you're going to have this big battle. No, you're not. I'm not going to give it to you. Um, but you have to deal with that. I mean, it's, and in some sense, this is, this is Tolkien's fault. Like so many things in fantasy, right? We are in his shadow and that shadow established certain things, right? And, and for better or worse, right? When I, um, when I, when I, when Tor first asked for uh, Shards of Heaven, you know, I'd, I'd written the first book and, and, and Paul Stevens reads it. He, you know, I got the email. I was, I was on the side of a cliff and in Arizona, Hey, there's shards. Oh, nice. there's shards. Shards is probably going to come out with a new name soon. Not soon. Awesome. But you'll have a, you'll have a uh, special edition. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, he, the, one of the first things he asked me is he said, it's, it's the first book of a trilogy, right? Uh, like, and of course the answer is yes, right? Yes, right. <laughs> yes. So I'll take. But there was that was like the default, right? Yeah. So it's the first book of a trilogy, right? With 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 Seaborn, you know, I was asked, you know, do you think you can write a trilogy of novels? But yeah, yeah, okay, right? But you know, it's because of Lord of the Rings. It's trilogy, 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 you know, and, and at this point it's now uh, a whole medium of weight, right? You know, I mean, Tolkien did it, but then Terry Brooks and then, you know, like we all know the list, right? So this is now what it is. Um, that's the default. And part of that default is too, yeah, you're going to have, uh, you know, big ass, big ass battle and it's going to be war. And because that's how, you know, things are at stake, right? The mm-hmm. world will end if this doesn't happen. Like it, you're going for that big stakes. This is the reason every friggin' Marvel movie, like, okay, first act, action sequence, go, right? Second act, action sequence, go, right? And the third one is going to be even bigger than the others. Everybody's going to come together. And at this point, it's so paint by numbers, it's disgusting. Like, yeah, because that's what it has been and it will continue to be until uh, the the mold is sufficiently broken so i don't i don't know that it's uh indicative of too much else other than we kind of expect it Mm. so at some level we kind of want it right i mean if you had a um if you had a batman movie with with no fights like (laughs) what the hell am i watching like 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 what is this you know, a, a, a Rocky movie that never goes to a boxing ring. Like, what What am I watching? Like, what is this? That would be very, very weird, right? I mean, at, at some level, it would be interesting, right? Because it's like, oh, ooh, that's an interesting take on, on Batman. Like, it's just him, like, chilling out and eating donuts. Interesting take, right? <laughs> yeah, like, <interesting>. right. <laughs> but it's not going to make any money, right? It's, you know? Critics right. might be like, "Ooh, the most brave Batman ever," but <laughs> never going to make any money. And and you want to make money, so you got to fulfill expectations. Yeah, I kind of wonder if it's like a chicken or egg kind of thing, where it's like that's the expectation, or that's just human programming. Uh, you know, with the we we enjoy the drama of something, and the absence of drama is generally less marketable to our brains. I don't know, like. Uh, you know, we we live in the day to day. We don't want 
Like, don't give me that, you know, <laughs> I'm, give me a bit of an escape that I can apply to my day to day. Yeah. But it's not, you know, here's a book about last Thursday afternoon, you know, like, unless your Thursday afternoon was way more exciting than mine. No, thank you. Yeah, it makes sense. Fantasy escapism, the idea of the word fantasy, um, that you are looking for something outside of maybe your day to day norm. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Dan Wiles, who's a fantasy author, friend of uh, Brandon Sanderson, he's writing a new Cosmere book, uh, I think, coming soon. Dan Wiles uh, has said in the past that he doesn't like fight sequences because the the entire point of a fight sequence is to uh, build tension, uh, to to ratchet up the tension. But the answer is basically binary: either the character wins or they lose, uh, and you're just you're just stalling to to get to that point. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? I love fight sequences. <laughs> um, so <laughs> maybe it's stalling. I don't know. I, I love I love fight sequences because I love and I can maybe this sounds weird. I love the aftermath. Um mm-hmm. you, you know, my 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 like my favorite moments you know, in, in the Shard series, for instance, um, are moments right after a, a, a big fight. And and the big fight was to get to that moment. Um, you know, so I guess, you know, without, without, as if anybody read, because anybody else is going to read those books, but uh, other than you, Brian, and you're a saint, um, <laughs> It, you know, but but to not spoiler, I guess, uh, just in case. Yeah, no spoilers, no spoilers, no spoilers on that. Um, early early in in book one, there's there's a, a fight in the room um, where, like uh, um, I said, I guess it's one of the first chapter, but the, but anyway, this is a little bit later on. Um, and the whole whole point of that was to have the moment of Varanus turning around um, and seeing his friend Titus Pulo holding the child and the, and the, and the look and the understanding between them and knowing what this has done to that child and, and how that's going to affect her moving forward. I had to have a fight scene, right? You, you know, it, 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 it required, for the characterization for to have this moment i needed all that and so the, and so i love i love fight scenes because they enable me to to get to, to that um and uh and, and yeah and the same goes through you know through all my books you know any of those fights it's that know that i know that i went into that fight scene to write the outcome of it that's why i wrote it i didn't i didn't write it because i wanted to talk about somebody stabbing someone or whatever it is. That's not what I wanted to do. What I wanted was that moment afterwards and what that means to everybody who was there. Um, that's why it existed. And that's how I composed it. Hmm. So take that, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, you bad take well, on fight scenes. By the way, we should put it. Have we put a link to shards of heaven in uh, the chat? If we haven't, we should have, uh, you know, <laughs> you can you try, get, get your copies while you, while you can. It's um, I took back the rights. Oh, um, there you go. So no new copies can be sold. Uh, they're probably selling out existing stock, but they can't make any new copies because I took back the rights. Um, um, I have a copy for sale. Twenty five thousand dollars. Right <laughs> first come, first serve. Uh, it's signed by the author. Uh, some guy that uh, was, was yeah. with a Sharpie. Um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, no, they're going to, uh, yeah, those are probably going to be re- reissued under new titles by a different publisher. <laughs> one of, uh, I one haven't of the come final... up with the titles yet, but <laughs> there you go. One of the final notes, uh, as I was thinking about the, the, this, this wonderful conversation we've had so far, and it's been great. I, I've watched people in chat and, uh, thank you all for who've come out and enjoyed this with us. Uh, Mike, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on these things and uh, for telling us which movies we can avoid uh, 
watching in the future if we want real takes on war. Uh, uh, Robert Jordan once was asked about like who who did he like see himself in in the books? You know, like what were the parts of him basically? Um, and he he said he had pointed out you know he talked about Matt and Perrin and Rand, but to start off the answer he said. Well, I don't know, as I like to point out, Lan was the guy I grew up wanting to emulate. You know, he talks about Matt has a little piece and Perrin being bigger than other people and Rand, you know, felt like an outsider. But I always thought that was like so unique. Like Lan was the person that he, as an individual, as a human being, wanted to emulate. And in context of this discussion where I go, okay, who was Lan, you know? What, what are the features of that character that he wrote into the series uh, that we met like really soon after it began and, and saw his journey, obviously not often through his own eyes, but that person that he wanted to emulate as we, uh, uh, I think, as most readers come to love Lan, right, and appreciate who he is and who, who he represents in the story and being that kind of warrior, right, that warrior and how he, how he is that warrior, right, as compared to other people, how he dedicates his life and how he views himself and his responsibilities, to me is fascinating in the context of this, of this question about war and the Wheel of Time and ultimately who Robert Jordan was. Uh, do you see anything, Mike, in what you've researched about Robert Jordan and war and the books themselves and putting together where you see that reflected that Lan was the guy that Robert Jordan wanted to emulate. Yeah. I mean, I can't not see it because it's when I met Jim, it was literally one of the only things that, that we exchanged um, was, was him saying, um, and I, I, I have this writ, written down. And I, I said it in the speech inducting him into the uh, South Carolina Academy of authors. Hmm. So if, if if I differ now from what I from what I what I said in that speech, the one I said in the speech is correct. Um, I, I'm older now and I may have forgotten the exact phrasing, but essentially it was you know Lan is the man I wish I always wish I could be. Um, and hearing that from him, and the um, in, 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 intensity with which he said that the, the sort of. Um, you know, stopping from signing a book kind of thing, you know, to kind of look you in the eyes, you know, that's the man I wish we, I, I can't, I can't pull those things apart. Like it's, you know, he seared that into my soul. Uh, so, you know, that is, that is the truth. Um, and nothing but the truth. Uh, you know, did I see, did I see that in the notes, you know, where he said, Lan is going to do X because it's what I wish I would have done. No, there's, yeah. there's nothing like that, but, um, I don't think there really needs to be. I think it's it's clear enough, uh, you, you know, simply reading that stoicism that Lan has, that um, utter utter devotion to to mission, um, which for which for me is is actually, and that's that may it may seem strange to people, but is is nowhere better encapsulated for me than in at the end of new spring um the novel um you know that moment on the hilltop when when he you know dedicates himself to a new a new mission you know it goes from this place of kind of utter despair for him and, and turns the switch you know this is now my mission and now this is my duty um that i mean that is that that's that's powerful um and it, and it's very hard not to see to 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 see Jim longing to to for that kind of simplicity, right? You know that, mm -hmm. and the, and the kind of uh, peace in a sense that that sim comes with that simplicity. Um, I, you know, every, everybody, you know, Wheel of Time is is amazing, but um, you know, New Spring that that book the more i've reread it the the more i see going on in that book um you know in the in the novel version 
um, that that is that is really really cool. I mean, you know, Land's arc in that is really quite something and doesn't get the attention it deserves. Uh, it's 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 really a shame that we didn't get the other other prequels, kind of you know, knowing what was going to be in them. Yeah. Um, you know those those arcs. You know, and there's enough in the notes to to see. I mean, oh, damn, <laughs> this would have been so good. Um, but yeah, New Spring is 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 awesome for for land. It's just great. Cool. I have two uh, two more questions for you before we wrap up, or as we wrap up. Um, the first, I think they're kind of fun questions. Um, okay. The first one is uh, in the Wheel of Time. There are the five great captains. There's uh, Pedro Nile, there's Agomar Jagad, there's Gareth Bren, Davron Bashir, and Rotel Dip Eduralde. Um, and they are the five great captains. They are the best generals in the world, or at least in Randland. Um, I want to know who you think the, the best generals are in history. Who are the five real world best generals? Oh. Okay. Do it. Uh, you got at least 13 minutes. <laughs> oh my god! Um, the five, so who are my real life five great captains? Yes, that is a that is a cruel question. Um, and you know what's actually funny about that question is as you were building up to that, I was like, oh god, Brian's going to ask me to choose which of those I think was the best general. And I was sweating bullets. How am I going to answer that? How am I? Gonna, and then you didn't ask that, and I was like. Whew. And then you ask that, and I'm like, screw you, Brian. Um, <laughs> uh, man, who would I choose? Um, you know, one of the problems is you, you know you know enough to know they're all flawed. Um, I mean, Hannibal, you know, look, Hannibal's awesome, uh, except when he's not. Um Alexander the Great, I mean, you know, hell, that guy gets gets the job done. Uh, but I wouldn't want to be within 10 miles of that guy. He was Looney Benz. Um, so, yeah, man, I don't, I don't know. Who would I actually want to serve under? I don't know. I think I would do a good job. Uh, I think I would do a good job. So I'm, so I'm obviously number one. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, really, like number one through nine on a top ten. Yeah, actually, um, no. In, in all honesty, I don't. That's a that's a great question, man. I'll I'll have to think about it. And see if I can think about it. We can talk about walk it. Walk on. Walk on. Yeah, yeah. See if we can talk about that walk on. I'm that is that is a that's a heavy one. Yeah, that's a heavy one. All right, all right. Um, the the last part is I know you have a book coming up uh, in I believe October uh, about the. Yes. Battle of Agincourt. Do you want to talk a little bit about that book and uh, tell us, give us your pitch and uh, why we should care about the Battle of Agincourt? Oh, thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, the Battle of Agincourt, um, it's called Agincourt, the Battle of the Scarred King. Uh, it comes out in October. Agincourt is, is 1415. This is Henry V, um, Band of Brothers speech, all that good stuff. Once more into the breach, my friends. Um, you know, look, it's one of the great battles in history. And I never thought I would write on it because, uh, I mean, everybody's written on Agincourt. There's nothing new to say. But then when I did the uh, Cray C book, um, which came out, whatever it was, two years ago, um, Cray C Battle of Five Kings. <laughs> is, is Brian grabbing a copy of it? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there he is. Yeah. So when, <laughs> when I was writing that book, um, there, I was like, there was enough stuff that was shifting around. I thought I need, I need to do research on Ashen Core. And, and, and in so doing, I was like, yeah, I got to write a book on this because the, the battle, you know, once again, I think has been misunderstood um, pretty heavily. And, and I was able to find enough pieces that I, I think I've got it. I think I got it pretty well sorted. And, and I honestly think, um, you know, if 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 anyone did read Crazy or, or read Never Greater Slaughter, um, my my book about the Battle of Brunnenberg, um, Agincourt I think is a better book. I think it's a better book. It's um, and the people who've read it have have been raving about it. So, 
yeah, I'm really looking forward to that coming out. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a cool story. And if you like, you know, it's not an academic book. It's just like written for everybody. So yep. uh, if you're interested in, in warfare or the medieval period or whatever, the hundred years of war, or Henry V, um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd encourage you to pick it up. Uh, pre-order, pre-order, pre-order now. Pre-order uh, now, yeah. Get, get, get a hold of it, Agincourt. It's got a good cover. Um, and then the next book after that will be uh, The Killing Ground, which is a biography of Thermopylae. So that's looking at um, all of the battles that have been fought in the past of Thermopylae from from the 300. Um, so the documentary 300, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the documentary 300. <laughs> Man, did, did, did that get rewritten? Um, and then and then all the way to um, uh, these amazing, uh, there's a there's a, like a, a battle with uh, Nazi panzer tanks and then uh, saboteur actions that happened in that past in World War II. Mm. So it's a, it's a hell of a fun book. So yeah, I got awesome. stuff coming up. Do you, got, do you have anything else that our audience might be interested in that's coming up soon? Uh, that's coming up soon? Well, I'm going to be a guest of honor at WatCon. So uh, come that's to WatCon. That's right, WatCon, everybody. You know, <laughs> that's <gotta come. laughs> get that's after it. it. Yeah, you got Bring you got till on. tomorrow end of day. Like register yeah. and come come see uh, us. No, I'm I'm look I'm looking forward to that. That's that's going to be awesome. Um, and then I'll be I'll be guest of honor at JordanCon next year. Awesome. And and hopefully hopefully, um, the print edition of Seaborn will be out uh, by JordanCon. I'm hoping that's that, that's what they're they're telling me they're going to aim for. So that that'll be out, um, which would be cool. Because I like I like those books, but they're uh, audible on there right now, and I know that's not everybody's cup of tea. So, if you are uh, coming to WatCon, and if you are still watching this um, this show after almost two hours, that means you really like war, so you should pre-order the Agincourt book. And if you do, and you show me your pre-order stuff at WatCon, I will have a surprise for you. So, Ooh. Uh, click the link in the chat. Master of the Deck just linked it. Go make a go place a pre-order. Send me your thing. I'll, I've got a surprise for you um, if you pre-order the book. So, what the, you you, what the hell have you done, Brian? You just gotta wait. Uh, man. You, you'll have to wait and see. <laughs> you'll have to wait and see. Uh, I don't know if you'll like it, but everybody else will like it. So, um, you know. Uh, do I even oh. do I even do I know about this one, Brian? Am I aware um, of this one? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Well, uh, well, thank you both for being here, especially, I mean, Brian, of course you, but especially you, uh, Michael, if again, if you have not ordered, read this book, I, you should, you should do that right now. Um, it's an amazing key, if you will, into how to understand Robert Jordan wrote oh, yeah. <laughs> the That's wheel of time. And as uh, as Michael has expressed, that's the it's a great way to you know uh, get to know Robert Jordan um, and understand his process and understand maybe why he was making some of the choices. And actually, if you want to keep investigating and researching, because even though this fellow here is as smart and as titled and as accomplished as he is, he's still he's still researching too. So um, there's a lot to still be understood. There's a many many layers to be soon discovered or uh for the for fans so into the decades that come so so much uh, and there's there's so many things like i i mean i tried to breadcrumb some stuff in that book like <laughs> i you know I, I i tried i tried to jordan it you know like okay what how would he how would he write this entry to yeah. to breadcrumb to the other stuff like let me see what i can do so there's yeah there's good fun there's stuff there people and if you come to walk on maybe Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Michael Reed from stuff he's continued to write. Um, you know, maybe oh, for sure something about Dumais oh, Wells. For sure. we'll so we're I'll, definitely we'll getting the expanded Dumais Wells entry. Dumais Wells, yes. Uh, yeah. looking he, to. he committed to that. Yeah, that's what I heard. I heard him. Yeah, that's that what I heard. Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> uh, and uh, and a final note to our uh, wonderful chat inhabitants. 
they they I heard there wasn't enough polling today during our show. Uh, that's just oh. how it is. I, I said, how many polls should there have been today? At least five got 25% of the vote, at least 10, 22%, at least 26%. It's not a Dusty Bill live stream without 20, 20 plus polls got 48% of the vote. I get you. Like they like their <laughs> polls around here. They expect to be polled and there wasn't enough polling going on, but uh, there will be in future live streams, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, in, in, in There will be. We'll, we'll bring those back uh, the next time. So. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for spending a little Father's Day with us talking uh, about war and the Wheel of Time. There's so many more things to be said and will be in the future. And uh, But thank you, uh, Mike, for coming on the show. And uh, good luck out there. And we'll see you, what, in like three weeks or something like that? Four weeks? I don't know. Something yeah, 26 like, days and one hour. Oh, how many? 26 days. 26 days my, and uh, one hour. <laughs> Do you see, <laughs> Brian? I forgot you have it listed there. Twenty six days, That's, everybody. Twenty six. That days. is awesome. That is awesome. I, you know, thanks for having me on. It's it's always a pleasure. And I, I because I'm on my iPad, I couldn't see what was going on in the chat. But thank you all for for being here. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah, and uh, and as we stay around here, good afternoon from the dusty wheel and smash to black. You went right to kill it. Look at you, you're all ready. You're just done. I mean, this is like, uh, this is one really of the well. biggest scenes. Um, and now I'm like, great, my turn, <laughs> And if you don't like that, and you want to say, well, Robert Jordan could have made the two rivers all white. He could have, but he option. didn't. So, okay. Just complimented me so, on my dress, and as you can clearly see, I'm sad. I see the like me as it. something along the lines of a Shida Haram analog. For it it does make sense why it outlasted the breaking. Yeah. <laughs> See, you know, this is why I have Therese in the show because she's going to correct everything that. Hey, everybody! I'm welcome to the Dusty Will Show. What? Me off challenge. Yay! Like baby face mounted on like a huge body. So like all <laughs> this is of a not sudden, just like, a wow. traditional fantasy, right? There, there are sci-fi. And just a moment ago, kind of uh, Rafe tweeted something. So let me get my guests in here with me, he and probably let's, I would let's say get, let's put in, in seventy, eighty percent of the work. I got to be over the shoulder and be like, no.